and you're muted, Zane. Good. Hello. Uh, I don't think I've ever attended class, so uh, I'm Zane. I'm uh, Arc Shop's uh, uh, staff and teaching fellow. Let me share my page. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, just uh, so this semester, I'm leading a course called in-house, which is an option studio for architecture students um, uh, with the simple premise of making an installation, designing and building an installation um, uh, with whatever the student has, you know, and wherever the student is. Um, and to help out, uh, uh, we've outfitted the students with a desktop milling machine called the Tiny Z. I think someone in this class is building one for their own project, my sympathies. Um, uh, so it's a, basically just aluminum stacked on top of more aluminum. Uh, it's really a pile of scrap material, which is rather amenable to reconfiguration. Um, uh, and it's extremely redundant. Um, uh, it uses a tiny G controller and um, the end effector that everybody was given at the beginning of the semester was a Dremel. Um, since then, we've and so on top of that, there's also this, this ability to kind of take the machine apart and, and extend axes and um, reconfigure and so forth. So uh, part of these videos were prepared for uh, as a provocation for architecture students at the studio previews way back in February. Um, uh, so the Sorry, that, that was showing uh, just lengthening the axis. Sorry? Lengthening. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, Swapping out, uh, uh, actually, I can show you with this this other video too. So let's go with this one. Um, swapping out the lead screw. All of the axes are driven by lead screws, but you can print your own parts a la Clank with very nice flexure joints and um, uh, have longer runs. So this is an X axis extended to eight feet with a 10 millimeter GT2 timing belt and some <laughs> iPhones strapped to the gantry so that you can take video and then scan whatever you've got lying around your yard or your apartment. Um, uh, so the payload obviously is not very much, but um, with the kind of flexibility, you're able to do a lot more experimentation. Um, uh, so for example, take the Dremel off and print play. Uh, so let me skip ahead here. There's a combination of using the arc shops as um, uh, uh, the resources at the arc shops to build your own machines and then take them home and play with them. Um, that's kind of the strategy of the course. Um, uh, and hope the intent is that the students end up with rather uh, uh, eccentric machines that more or less reflect the materials they're working with rather than the sort of base kit. And so we're nearing the end of the semester now and a couple of people have deviated from the base kit. A couple of people have gone in towards uh, um, uh, experimenting with wood or wax or foam. Did, did um, I see a fourth axis? Uh, yeah, so that was part of an unexpected four axis exercise to support students milling bamboo and branches from their yard. Um, uh, so this is taking the bed of the machine. Oh, okay, so there's a preamble which is if your 3D printers stop working, uh, you can always just machine your parts out of aluminum. I probably should have done this out of HDPE, uh, but in any case, um, uh, and of course the flexures from Clank don't really work in aluminum, so uh, we, re we machine some very nice uh, eccentric bushings for, um, uh, based on Jens's uh, design. We machined some 3D prints that didn't work with the new design. Uh, a lot of aluminum milling. These are super sweet. Um, so the Tiny G has four motor slots, so you can take the fourth motor and make it an extruder or make it a uh, rotary positioner. Um, so here we are just 
drilling or routing uh, an ellipse. Hmm. Um, we're using Mastercam for all of our G code. Uh, so uh, that's that. Um, some of the student projects I've linked here. So most of these students don't have any experience with uh, fabrication, or at least they have minimal experience. Um, that's not, uh, there are some exceptions. Um, so this student is using clay as a, to droop over domestic objects, um, wax, machining, and then remelting, um, and then casting, and then melting again with, uh, this is a tool for etching wood, but I think it's also like doubles as a soldering iron. There's all sorts of attachments that she's using to you to end up with different effects. Um, uh, one of my dreams at the beginning of the course was to do a uh, vacuum hold down for the Tiny Z. So I rapidly did it at the beginning and then gave it to a student and she's been drag knifing uh, fabric to make a kind of a, a garment-like um, surface for her room. Um, uh, wood, so just using the Dremel. Uh, food, so one student's extremely interested in making a alternative to beef patties, so mixtures of gluten and flour and God knows what else. Um, uh, and his final project will actually be a dinner party when we can all come out of hiding. Um, uh, on top of that, larger spindles, still trying to work out how feasible it is to run very, very long jobs with quarter inch tooling. Um, I showed the five, four axis thing. My personal project is the five axis version of this machine, which I got running last week after a lot of coordination with, well, a lot of advice from Jake. Um, uh, and so Sorry, is, that, is that using Jake controllers now? Nope, it's using a smoothieware uh, a controller two um, uh, NEMA 17s on the x-axis that are being driven by external um, uh, stepper drivers that are just wired in parallel. Um, everything is belt drive. Um, uh, what else is there to say? I still have to, so my to-do is still have to add end stops. Sh um, show the cool video again. OK. <laughs> um, yeah end stops and then um, there's a mechanical issue with the B axis. Somehow there's like a little bit of play between the shaft, the output shaft of the motor and the hub that it's sitting in. Um, and then just this morning I was playing around in Mastercam. So I'll just, I think I can get away with using a generic FANUC um, post and Mastercam supports five axis machining, so I think that's how I'll be sending instructions to the to the machine. So uh, uh, I don't have any limits yet, so that's still to do and I have to test this tiny spindle, which is also still to do. So uh, right now the spindle is a belt driven um, version of I think Jake has tried this in the past with his mother machine or whatever it's called. Um, and we talked about crown pulleys, so that's probably probably next. I still have to test this out. So, a couple comments in first. Yeah, you know, for a humble machine, this is great progress in rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping and powering machine building by non-experts. That's great. Um, a couple things percolating in the class that might be of interest. Uh, Jens has been be doing beautiful stuff on making rack and pinions at parametric axes. And Jake, Quentin, and I all have flavors of network controls for scaling uh, the distributed controls. Um, uh, Martin is asking how you made the fourth and fifth axes. Uh, 3D printed and uh, two face mount cross roller bearings of different sizes. Um, uh, they're doing most of the work, really. OK. Um, for everybody else, this is all nicely documented on Zane's page. And again, Zane, there are a bunch of things in the pipeline of the class that I think may be of interest for next steps for you. Nice. Good. Um, the, um, here, I'll put in the chat. Zane's page is here. 
Okay, so thank you, Zane. And I know you have a time conflict you have to get to. Um, March and take over. Who are you and what kind of machines do you make? Can I share my screen? Please. And so for background, assume you're talking to master machine builders. Yeah, let's see. Um, Good. You guys can see this? Yep. My name is Marchin. I build open source industrial machines to rebuild civilization from scratch. You can see my TED talk on this. Uh, we focus on, so So today I want to talk about just, just we actually take a look at the very big picture. How do you solve pressing world issues with open hardware technology? The principles are collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. And the practices, we really get down to how do you get p average people engineering uh, real stuff, like public engineering of systems, uh, where we actually don't, do, don't focus now so much on design as, as much as design guides to allow everybody to participate for the sake of large scale collaboration. So I'll talk a little bit about what the kind of stuff we've built. Uh, so we work on the Global Village Construction Set 50 industrial machines, but we take it from an industrial uh, uh, construction set approach. So when we design these things, we don't really design one thing at a time. We design whole sets of things. So for example, you can easily um, conceptualize that you can build a construction set like Legos for mechanical things, but that could apply to anything. Talk, t talk about you know, power electronics where you have a small brain and modular power elements that you can scale readily. You can do this for construction of houses. You can do this for anything. So that's what we're finding out. We also use a pattern language. So we break down, we've got, so we've got a number, maybe like a dozen construction sets. You've got 50 machines, but you also have about 500 modules. If you look at uh, what every single machine on this planet, maybe like, I don't know, 80 to 99% of all machines are made of primitives like rotors, actuators, batteries, uh, frames, uh, solenoids, materials, various things. So we're trying to break down what all technology is made of to, to about 500 and we, we turn it into a visual pattern language. So for example, an electric car is, can be represented by the symbol on the right. So um, frame, uh, rotors, power unit, fuel, etc. Uh, so the design tools that we use are quite basic. So we use, uh, we built our work on FreeCAD for 3D design. We use Sweet Home 3D for design of interior design and design of housing. We use KiCad, uh, the KiCad. We use Blender for communications. We do Caden Live and OBS Studio for the 3D printing and controls. We use the Arduino Marlin Cura tool chain. Uh, for 2D design, we use actually LibreCAD. But okay, so that's the kind of things we build. So start with the basic building blocks of everything. So you got frames, um, things like frames, which here are small frames that are 3D printed plus angle, which is scalable up to maybe up to like say three feet, or you can build larger things that are welded together. Uh, still kind of a, this is actually made from f a six flat pl panes. We found that this is actually, if you want to do a very large structural unit, make six, six flat pieces and weld them together. So we use either like flat pieces that can be CNC cut or box beam tubing, which applies to frames like for a CNC torch table, which applies to this uh, iron worker machine made of half inch tubing box beam that can cut up to one, one inch by eight inch steel. So you can do some heavy duty design with this uh, modular approach, or you can do tractor frames and things like that. For uh, actuators, we use what's called the universal axis. Here we show the, the both the eight millimeter and 25 millimeter versions. And these are all for all various types of CNC machines, including if you scale this to larger size, like say this is one inch, so it's plastic metal composites, you can scale it to two inch for much larger. So if you put it on a frame like this large frame here, you can talk about a heavy duty machine. Or if you put it on even a larger frame with two inch axes, you can do, talk about things like a sawmill, a CNC sawmill. That's actually what we're planning to build this year, end of this year. Uh, so we then run with modular power units. Now this, we run on hydraulics largely. This is an engine with, uh, that puts out hydraulic power through a small pump. We use uh, universal rotors. The, the, the one on the left is a, is a large one that's applicable to tractors, like tractor wheel drive. The small one on the right is for CNC machines. They're both a version of universal rotor. So effectively, like if you take a look at the stepper motor, the, the big one on the left is actually the, the industrial grade version of that, uh, control, controlled by hydraulics, which we use in uh, machines like tractors. 
where you can see the universal rotor driving either like the, the big trencher wheel or the actual wheel units on the tractor. Uh, the power units, like for example, this is a small tractor which uses one power unit and this can go up to 25 horsepower, or this tractor, this one here has got three power units, so this one is 75 horsepower. So this is modular frames, um, universal rotors, um, power cubes, and you can then talk about uh, controllers. Uh, I'll talk about that, How, what do we do for control and automation, but here, what do we do for the day-to-day, -day? grind, weld, and torch? We do CNC torch tables. This is version one to cut our steel for our tractors. We this is our latest prototype, the version three of the CNC torch table going to the universal axis. Away from this, actually, here we're like kind of going more into the 3D printing and belts, belt drive, and um, metal plastic composites. Or you can do CNC circuit melts. And once again, this is the same eight millimeter universal axis applicable to now in this different configuration to a CNC circuit mill. We also use a lot uh, of the 3D printing. Once again, these two machines are 3D printers that both use the same eight millimeter universal axis. Okay, so for controllers, here's this device right here can control all the machines that I've shown before. This is just ramps, Marlin, Arduino tool chain. Um, um, this is applicable to, to Cura. Uh, Marlin, we're actually using Marlin. We're, we're going like, okay, what's the simplest thing we can do for multi-axis machines? So certainly you can do three axis. This is a three axis uh, system with external stepper drivers for the CNC torch table, or you can do the onboard stepper drivers for uh, without the green larger external drivers for applications like the circuit mill or the, uh, the 3D printer. Or you can use this with, uh, instead of the large stepper drivers for power control, you can use it with larger uh, solenoids or solid, solid state relays. Here actually we have a solid state relay. But actually Marlin, when you look, about, look at it, when you look at ramps, you actually have the ability to control a very large number of stepper motors because of all the output pins on an Arduino Mega that's underneath it. So you can do like, um, not only three to five axis, like off the existing stepper drivers on the Marlin, uh, on the ramps board, you already have five axes, but you can put out, uh, you can use many more of the other pins through all the other headers or you can go underneath the board. So you can have a, a screw machine that's got 10 or 20 axes. So actually that's pretty interesting because you're using the lowest possible uh, complexity components. Uh, now, um, this is not exactly us, but, but some collaborators are working on a, a more advanced tool chain, open source Coriolis, very large scale integration for 180 nanometer scale 2000, uh, year 2000, 2001 integrated circuit technology. That's actually open source too. Um, if, if anybody, by the way, if you, any of you guys want to join us, there's a mailing list. Uh, um, one of our friends, that's Luke Layton, he's building um, basically a, an integrated circuit that's equivalent to cell phone circuits, which are, is basically a microprocessor, fully open source, fully open source uh, software tool chains as well. That's a little bit of a side because that's some of our collaborators, but I wanted to bring that out to say that, hey, there's uh, an open source, you, there's a lot of stuff coming out that can be uh, feasible. So here's um, more applications of the, like what can you build with the stuff we just described? So larger printers, tractors, uh, this is a replication by some people. Uh, brick presses for building housing. Uh, we also do, like, if we talk about the, the workflow that we do, we do a lot about swarm builds, like large groups that build this p parallel modular design. So you can do this aquaponic greenhouse in five days or this house with 50 people in five days as well. Uh, this one that we live in right now, actually, or this aquaponic greenhouse, we kind of... We, we, we run workshops to build these things in short periods. Uh, so I described the product ecology where you can get from 3D printers to parts for larger machines like, like torch tables, which can cut metal parts for larger machines. We also talk about uh, the recycling where one of the machines in the Global Village construction set is uh, the shredder uh, and induction furnace and, and plastic extruder. So you can take, you can grind your metal or plastic with an induction furnace and metal rolling infrastructure, you can get virgin steel or you can get virgin 3D printing filament or plastic from plastic extrusion. Uh, so we also talk about using common abundant materials like soil to make compressed earth block, limestone, burning that in a lime burner to, to get concrete. Um, so for example, like here we have lime under our earth. We can take that and through an open source machine and the solar energy, we can burn lime uh, to make concrete, to make uh, zero carbon concrete. Nobody does that, but it, it's feasible. It, well, solar PV is quite cheap these days, so it's actually, when you look at some of those numbers, um, they actually start to make sense in that we can compete with 
uh, industrial production of cement using um, small scale PV operations. We take we also take um, we, we're not doing this yet, but hey, you can turn it into insulation or straw board. Like they make cork, like cork is basically compressed, uh, heated uh, cork bark. You can t do the same to hay to make uh, strand board that's basically uh, done by heat and pressure, no chemicals. And trees you can take into lumber, so we've built a lumber mill already. Uh, so we talk a lot about using local abundant resources to make building materials of all kinds. Uh, and the most advanced machine in our system is the aluminum extraction from clay, which we haven't built, but if you have aluminum silicate, which is uh, common, <laughs> that's, that's turned into alumina and can, turn be, can be turned into aluminum. So that's like the most advanced you can do off any parcel of earth. So that's a brief overview of the kind of tech we do and uh, uh, maybe ask any questions if everyone's got any. Sure. For first, very impressive. Uh, start with where are you doing this work and talk about the organization. Yeah, uh, we're in the Kansas City area of Missouri and the organization is called Open Source Ecology. So we're um, we're a nonprofit or organized in the United States. So we have a land-based facility of 30 acres where we do all these experiments. We've got a workshop where this year we're building up a bunch of more workshops and building up infrastructure to have people here on site full time to basically do like a research and development campus. Okay, and then but the, the, the question they offer, the, the offer is we have a number of projects in this yeah. working group in the class on things like distributed control. So there's no central controller and the machine runs as a real time network and so mm -hmm. you can add freely um, and ways to make a uh, parametric. Mm -hmm. um, in what you're doing, what's rate limiting? You know, what's your wish list that you, you're doing a lot, so what can't you do? Global collaboration, actually, productization of some of these things. Because the thing that blew me away, like, for example, in 2008, I published the first working really good version, like 10 bricks per minute brick press, which is a great industrial product. The bottom line is nobody replicates. The enterprise does not uh, really take off yet. So we're working on a, the enterprise development part because we're finding that it's very hard to find entrepreneurs who understand open source and, and can, can help, help us. That's a limiting step. Also, in terms of global collaboration, there's a lot of room for, okay, for example, take the tractors that we have right now through remote control or even uh, take, take something like a video game that's IoT, like uh, IoT tractors. Like there's no reason why I can't be sitting right now in front of my computer controlling the machine that's out there building my foundation instead of me getting my body bruised up and potentially killed by a tractor uh, doing that work. So, so there's a lot of opportunity there for uh, artificial intelligence, like autonomous vehicles that right now could be going out in the trees, planting things and doing computer vision to take care of things like agriculture operations that are sustainable, regenerative, and can feed people by combining automation with uh, the kind of hardware technology that we have, which is not a far cry because it's just basically an Arduino controller, some, some wireless controls going to that, which can already be done with a simple Arduino that we're doing, things like that. So, so if you want to talk about collaboration, a lot of this IoT kind of nature, remote control stuff would be great. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, of course, this group group knows a lot about things like um, wireless interconnect, uh, more advanced embedded processing, and mm -hmm. uh, things like pattern recognition and inference. Interesting. Anybody else questions, comments? Yeah, some of, the, some of those like thermal processes, like this, the steel continuous casting and rolling, those are, those are hard and mm -hmm. pretty, pretty intense. Have you, have you guys had good success doing steel processing with, with machines you've built? We haven't gone to the the place of virgin virgin steel yet. That's on the next next in line. But we're looking at 200 kilowatt of induction furnace power, and there you go. That provides about 2,000 pounds easily of virgin steel per day. So if you talk about an economically viable operation, that's the scale we're looking at. Wow. Anybody else? But I mean. That's power electronics. We've got power electronics designers to do open source and scalable induction furnaces. Come on down. How how big of a, an induction furnace have you guys have you guys built so far? We haven't. I'm just we haven't even curious. done an induction furnace. Uh, that's we haven't. We closest to that was the gasifier where we make charcoal and we ran, ran our engines on it, but that's not not there yet. We're, and we don't want to do like any uh, carbon-based fuels. The induction is a much more efficient, controllable process. 
And just to pump what we're doing this summer, like the September 1st through November, end of November, we're doing three months of, it's called the Summer of Extreme Design Build. So we're actually building a lot of these, like the next iterations of all the machines and b actually training builders. I talked about the enterprise aspect that's not picking up, that limiting step. So we're actually training builders to go out and build the seed eco homes and aquaponic greenhouses as a, as a real business. We were, we're at that stage where we're replicating. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Martin, if you're interested, I can add you to the class project if you want to keep uh, sitting in on these. Um, we have a good, good good group working on it. Uh, uh, what's the class um, project? Meaning just the, the group here, you see. Meaning okay. uh, this is a th this machine building class, we meet each week, and half of it is lectures, and half that we're about to do right now is updates on a lot of projects. And there are a number of people sitting in now who aren't MIT students but are part of the, the larger uh, family. Uh huh. Um, and so, if you want, I'd be happy to add you to that. Yeah, I'm recording this. Actually, we're in a process. We're in a workshop right now, building another s welding trusses right now. So I actually got to get back down there. But I'm going to record this. Uh, I am recording this, so I can review that later. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, just one other quick comment is. Yeah. Early on, when we started doing machines that make machines, we thought we were done, and we're disappointed they didn't propagate. Yeah. Um, we found. We had to do a bunch of things that we weren't taking seriously initially. One was build organizational capacity, like bring up thousands of fab labs and of organizations to support them was one piece. Um, one piece was we spun off a number of companies to help them propagate. Um, one was we had done a poor job on just uh, documenting. And um, all of those are coming together. We, we, we seem to be just now beginning to cross that uh, that line. Um, are are there open, any open source products that can be replicated at this point? I, I know like maybe Yens or maybe the laser cutter. There's a couple. What's the most well, promising? Yeah, so I'd say th there's a matrix. There, there's systems um, mm -hmm. that go into it. And you know, maybe most relevant to you isn't the finished systems we're working on, but things like the, the network controls and the mm -hmm. parametric uh, mm -hmm. access generators and you know uh, the geometry engines and, and there are a bunch of those built building block capabilities yeah. level yeah. upstream tools you've been using yeah yeah like starting with the fourth and fifth axis like today mm -hmm. yep yep yeah. okay a uh, very impressive Martin thank you thank you um, okay then Rob take over okay here we go yes I will share. So yeah, Martin, if you stop sharing now, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. You should be seeing my, my notes on the micro spindle. This is the uh, spindle that uh, that Zach and I, uh, Jake and I have been have been working on, with the intent of replacing collets and and purchase spindles with things like bearings and, uh. and drivers, and so <clears throat> this. This is this is the first iteration. Rather than talk about a lot of details, I'll show you I'll show you four or five iterations and tell you what what we learned in each each time. This is the first iteration. I think there is a you can see it actually cuts pretty nicely. Oh, that's not terrible. It just you know I'm just driving with an O-ring driver uh, mm -hmm. with the with the bit uh, jammed in between two O-rings like so this. Sorry, sorry again. I'm just catching up. So that's uh, three skate type bearings, and you yep. put push the bit against it, and you roll an O ring. That's right. Yep, yep. And I I push the driver at an angle, so that it's exerting some upward force to keep the to keep the bearing to keep the bit from flying out. Got it. And um, it cuts a nice it cuts a nice trace. The second trace that it cuts, it begins to have trouble on the corners, and the third one is 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 a bit. Uh, a bit psychedelic. Sorry, um, what, what's going wrong? And what's going wrong is that the the O ring is squashing the 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 PLA of the of the O ring driver is deforming. Uh, other things are deforming in the system. Yeah. I just don't oh. I don't have enough stability. Yeah, uh, Marchin, this is this is bad design one. Uh, Rob's going to show iteration. Marchin, if you're still on, Cameron is working on a superconducting design project, and we've been using like a million dollar cadence installation. She's asking if you have any pointers to the IC project um, you were talking about. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, Martin, if you can answer in the chat and you point us to the IC project. Rob, go on. Okay, good. Just a, just a video of this, of, of this one cutting. Okay, so, so it can work, but not stable. It can work, but not terribly stable. Okay, go on. So, so I, I need more stability. I need, I, need a, I need a stiffer arrangement of some kind. Yes. Uh, iteration B was, was kind of a distraction. I decided that it would be fun to do it with just two bearings with a bit stuck inside, which works beautifully for a bit that happens to be a couple tenths uh, smaller than the one eighth inch bearings. Uh, but of course, not very practical unless you want to, to do centerless grinding on everything and make right. things fit. But what I did learn here was that I can successfully, more successfully drive and keep the, and keep the bit up in the spindle. Okay. Uh, so the next, the next version took six bearings and completely surrounded the bit to, to, make, them, to make them stiff. Uh, in this arrangement, I didn't have room to drive the bit itself with the O-ring, but drove the OD of the bearings, which turns out to be kind of a nice idea because uh, just because the you know it, it's a lot easier to drive something with a 10 millimeter diameter than a three millimeter diameter. Uh, the match between the driver and the OD and the and the bearings are nice. The problem with this is that it's it's lacking it, it's lacking the. Uh, the axial force to keep the the bit from diving down into the into the to the uh, surface, which is exactly what it okay, does. Okay, so so x y is now happy, um, but z is not. But z is unhappy. Yep. Right. And some you know some slight slight different versions of this decided while I had this together I'd try driving above the bearings that was a, a dismal failure just because it, you, know, you can't have that f force on a cantilever and expect it to be to be stable so the next one um, I figured out how to design something so I could support with six bearings and drive with a wheel in the center with the wheel at a tilt. I was able to cut a pretty nice, I think there's a picture of a test pattern here. Uh, so I got down to you know, really a nice low run out uh, with, with this kind of a cage approach. And I was able to cut out a board, uh, but, but the whole thing distorted and failed when I tried to face off a sacrificial layer. Uh, so just too much force and you can see that you can see, sorry, I'll scroll around here. You should be able to see that this thing is distorting. It's yep. still PLA, just not, again, just not enough stiffness. Otherwise, things are looking pretty pretty promising. Um, and so at this point, I decided it would, I, I really liked driving on the OD of the bearings, but needed a way to, to provide better Z force. So I decided I wanted to add an yeah, idler. You know the OBS. So I, I, was, I was just going to say idler, uh, and that sort of kind of works. Except, uh, let's see what what happened here. Oh, the the problem here. I I did learn something interesting. Here's here's a movie of. I'm muted, and then the video stops. So, but here, this is. Stop recording. No, but then it's recording. The, oh. you know, people to see. What is it again? This key? This? No. What? This? This? Look on it, yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's next to escape. Show. Yeah. Show.
no problem. Yeah? Yeah.